have the privilege of overseeing the Norman Miller Center for Peace, Justice, and Public Understanding. So I'm pleased to welcome you this evening to the Norman and Lewis Miller Lecture in Public Understanding. And uh, I'd, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about the lecture and then also to uh, uh, give you a little bit of, of background on our center and what it is that we do. Uh, some years ago, our, the Norman, what is now called the Norman Miller Center was the Peace and Justice Center. And uh, it was under the direction of Sister Sally Ann Brickner, who is seated right there. Wave your hand. There's Sally Ann. <clears throat> who, who ably guided the center and its programs for a number of years before uh, I, I came. And uh, shortly after I came to St. Norbert College in 2009, I think it was, um, I was approached by some good friends in our advancement department and they said, we have a lecture series that probably fits really, really well with the work of the center. And that is, uh, it, it, it had, had been founded in 1993 as the Lewis Miller Lecture in Public Understanding. It was founded by the Norman Miller Family Foundation to honor the life of Lewis Miller, a native of Green Bay who died in 1989. And at that time, his brother Norman, an area developer and longtime advocate for the common good and for human rights, stated, I'm pleased that my brother's name will be memorialized through a continuing series of lectures at St. Norbert College that will promote peace and better understanding. That phrase, better understanding, and public understanding, uh, has some history with Norman Miller. When he was an undergraduate at Northwestern, a sophomore, in fact, he started a program called Better Understanding Week that was aimed at some practices of anti-Semitism that they saw there at Northwestern. In fact, uh, while a sophomore at Northwestern, as the story goes, he had gone in to, to visit the president of the school, uh, this is 1942, to talk about the fact that at that time, the new engineering school was not allowing Jews. And <clears throat> when he was rebuffed by that administration, uh, he decided to go higher. And so he sent a telegram to the US Supreme Court. He went high. And he told them that he wanted to talk to them about a matter of national concern, of national importance. In 1942, there were lots of issues of national importance. <laughs> <clears throat> but they welcomed him. And so he took a train to DC and was met at the, at the station by Ralph Bunch who then introduced him to Louis Brandeis and Felix Frankfurter and drove them around town. And uh, then Ralph Bunch became the first speaker for what was then Better Understanding Week at uh, Northwestern in Chicago. After the war in which he had served in the Navy, uh, Norman Miller came back home to Green Bay, uh, accompanied by Sherlin, then his wife, uh, Sherlyn is still enjoying her winter in Palm Springs, by the way, and sends her greeting to all of you. Um, but he was accompanied, Norman and Sherlyn came back to Green Bay and began their, their family here. He continued to work in the area of interfaith programs uh, with breakfasts and things like that. He was influential in the fair housing laws, working with city council and with uh, the, actually the coach of the Packers, Vince Lombardi, to change the housing laws in Green Bay and to make it possible for the African-American players at the Packers, with the Packers to, to purchase homes. So Norman Miller dedicated his life to that sort of thing. And when he passed away in 2008, his name was added to the title of these annual lectures. A couple of years after that, uh, his name was added to what was at that time the Peace and Justice Center. And we became the Norman Miller Center for Peace, Justice, and Public Understanding. There's that public understanding phrase back. 
And that recognizes the legacy of that family, the legacy of, of the Miller family and their work for public understanding that began in the early 1940s. So this lecture series, continuing the legacy of the men for which it's named, <clears throat> excuse me, the Norman and Lewis Miller Lecture in Public Understanding, promotes unity, communication, and tolerance among different cultures, religions, ethnicities, and traditions. The lecture series celebrates human dignity and it encourages better understanding between people, both domestically and internationally. It is uh, the high point of our programming season through the Norman Miller Center uh, when we have these lectures every fall and spring. Uh, an influential individual on our staff uh, without whom these would not look nearly as good is our program coordinator, Catherine Udelhofer. Catherine, thank you. <laughs> I also want to thank our student staff, uh, really wonderful student staff, uh, Abigail Planky, Ellie Socha, Sydney Gothier, Delaney Sieber, and our Delaney is one of the ones graduating. I'm sorry, Sydney is one of the ones graduating. Um, and Delaney, I want to thank you too for the wonderful music you provided at the reception upstairs. That was really lovely. <laughs> and another one of our graduating seniors uh, as our, our senior community organizer is Maggie McConaughey. And uh, I'm going to bring Maggie up here in a moment to introduce our speaker this evening. It's fitting that uh, Maggie is the one actually to do this introduction because um, sometimes uh, we learn a lot from our students. Sometimes they learn a little from us. Sometimes we learn a little from them and sometimes we learn a lot from them. And Maggie is one of the ones from whom I learn a lot. And I appreciate always the fact that she's willing to gently uh, correct or confront or express concern uh, to me when I uh, sometimes uh, uh, maybe don't say things quite properly or am insensitive to some of the people around me or uh, just have massive blind spots that only somebody from her perspective can clearly see. And, and Maggie is gentle in those corrections. And, and I appreciate that. And, and I, I truly do appreciate the way she has helped shape the work of our center. She's in many ways made us more professional. She's in many ways uh, made us more inclusive. She's helped us be better at what we do. And, and I'm grateful for that. One of the ways in which Maggie has been a part of this particular series is in offering feedback uh, together with our uh, Norman and Lewis Miller Lecture Committee, which by the way, I forgot to name you, but if you would raise your hands, members of that committee who are here, I'm grateful for your input as well. Maggie has sat in on some of these conversations as a student representative and about a year and a half ago, she looked at our list of potential speakers and she said, I just want to say, and I could tell this was one of those gentle moments, I just want to say, I would be disappointed if you didn't have Sean Copeland here before I graduate. <laughs> and I said, well, we can work on that. And so we have. And so we're delighted to welcome M. Sean Copeland tonight as our Miller lecturer, but I'm delighted to welcome Maggie McConaughey to introduce her. That was really too kind, goodness gracious. Um, M. Sean Copeland is a professor of systematic theology in the Department of Theology, the College and Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Boston College. She's taught theology at Yale University Divinity School, Marquette University, 
and in my opinion, most importantly, <laughs> theology at St. Norbert College. She focuses on topics like suffering, freedom, gender, and race. She uses a mixture of theology and history, religious and cultural Africanism to describe the African-American Catholic experience. She's a former convener of the Black Catholic Theological Symposium, and she was the first African-American to serve as president of the Catholic Theological Society in America, of America. A theology education should not be considered complete without her influential works, which include books, articles, reviews, book chapters, and published lectures. Just like so many of my peers, I first encountered Dr. Copeland's works in Enfleshing Freedom in a favorite SNC course, Feminist Theology. Using an understanding of the differences of gender, race, and sexuality, Copeland opened up the eyes of my class to view not only the images of God, but of our own bodies. With these different images, Copeland's text helped us to explore the college's then mantra, solidarity. Last night at the CVC, Professor Copeland invited us into solidarity, deep listening, and gentleness. With these hopes in mind, it gives me great joy to introduce to you all Professor M. Sean Copeland. mostly because I've been here before. <laughs> and in a certain way, uh, I had an opportunity to learn a great deal here, and for that I'm very grateful. Not all of the people to whom I'm grateful are able to be here this evening, but I do believe that they are with us in spirit. Uh, I'm very grateful to the Norman Miller Center for Peace, Justice, and Public Understanding for inviting me uh, for this lecture. I'm grateful to Catherine Udelhofen for all of the conscientious attention to practical details. Uh, thank you so much. I'm sort of gobsmacked periodically because I'm looking at people's faces in, in this room who I know, uh, whom I know, and I am uh, very touched to see some of uh, my former colleagues here and friends uh, in this room. So thank you really for taking the time uh, to be here this evening. <clears throat> I also am grateful to the Cassandra Voss uh, Center uh, for the wonderful conversation in which, uh, which we participated last evening. And thank you so much, Bridget, for, for your kindness. Um, you and, uh, and Jaime, really, so, so kind, so kind. As a nation, we are besieged with intractable problems. The criminalization of poverty, the increased privatization and growth of the prison industrial complex, along with massive rates of incarceration, particularly among black and brown youth and men. Homelessness, unemployment, and disemployment. The erosion of our urban infrastructure, a compromised supply of clean potable water, substance abuse, religious and cultural chauvinism, ethnic division, bigotry, racial animosity, in particular anti-black animus, hatred of immigrants, fear of differently abled, queer, transgendered women and men. And the poorer the neighborhood and the darker the skin of its residents, the more likely it is to be near a toxic waste dump. This is certainly no description of America the beautiful. We may see ourselves and our predicament in the book of Job. The wicked remove landmarks or boundaries from their neighbor's property. They thrust the needy off the road. 
The poor of the earth all hide themselves. They scavenge for food for their young. They lie all night naked without clothing and have no covering in the cold. They are wet with the rain of the mountains and cling to the rock for want of shelter. The fatherless child is snatched from the breast. The infant of the poor is seized for a debt. Lacking clothes, they go naked. They carry the sheaves, but still are hungry. They crush olives. They tread the wine presses, yet suffer thirst. The groans of the dying rise from our city, and the souls of the wounded cry for help. This is book 24, chapter 24, verses 2, 4, 7 to 12. We ask ourselves why. Why are our cultural and social, that is our political, our economic, and technological practices so marred by moral indifference? Why does poverty persist for millions of our citizens? Why such xenophobic reactions to the human other? Why sometimes subtle, sometimes overt anti-Semitism, racism, misogyny? Why such regard, disregard for our common social duties, obligations, and responsibilities? Why such careless degradation of nature? Why such mindless living? Is it possible for us to acknowledge our complicity in and responsibility for the sinful situation that is the consequence of our individual and social judgments, decisions, choices, and actions? What role can religious faith take in apprehending and healing these communal wounds, in creating change, in bringing about justice in the concrete, in the here and now? How can we, women and men of faith, meet the intellectual and moral challenges these problems provoke? And how can we respond to the negativity we have spawned? The Hebrew and Christian scriptures teach and hold an understanding of the human person that asserts the sacredness, radical equality, and intimate connection of all life before God. These scriptures hold and teach a notion of virtue which requires that we collaborate in the realization of justice and right in the society in which we live. Moreover, the scriptures oblige us to plead humbly and unceasingly, not only before the seat of divine mercy and justice, but before our sisters and brothers. The prophet Isaiah warns us, the Lord of hosts look for justice, but behold, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, a cry. Chapter 5, verse 7. The scriptures then require of us concrete practices of justice and right in our daily living, in all our relationships, if we are to enjoy a foretaste of the beautiful city of God on earth. This evening, I want to arrange my reflections, my remarks about some of these problems in three parts. In the first, we'll sketch notions of culture and cultural diversity. The second will raise some issues around racist culture or a culture of racism. And the third will make some rather large suggestions about how believers and all persons of goodwill might disturb the aesthetics of our present for the sake of our future. So culture and cultural diversity. To speak about cultural diversity is to assume an understanding of culture. And I take culture to be a dynamic activity of critical imagination, understanding, judgment, and mediation. Culture is a set of meanings and values that inform a way of life. These meanings and values may be expressed in art, language, symbols, ideas, concepts, 
attitudes, and in the lives and deeds of youth, women and men. At the same time, these meanings may be presented concretely in the institutions that we develop, the roles, the tasks, the cooperations and operations in our society, in the political setups or structures that we have, in economic arrangements, in educational institutions, in technological discoveries and inventions. As the philosopher Susan Langer puts it, quote, a culture is made up of the activities of human beings. It is a system of interlocking and intersecting actions, a continuous functional pattern, close quote. Thus, culture making is an essential aspect of our humanity. What is human in human life is that which is cultural. And through our culture, we express our common and complementary understandings of communal or collective experiences. We effect or bring about authentic expressions of our understandings, our understandings of that experience and the complementarities and critiques that are made. In this way, we also critique and transform ourselves and our social order in the light of our values and communicate all this to one another and to other human beings. The cultural diversity of humankind is self-evident. Travel makes this plain. In distant and near places, we meet other human beings who express themselves through meanings and values that may and often differ from our own or sometimes are just similar enough to strike us as startling strange. Their grasp and formation of meaning and value differ and are distinct. The notion of cultural diversity then suggests a variety or diversity of cultures, a variety of meanings and values. These are formulated and expressed by human beings in their lived experience. Human beings can and do function in more than one cultural setting, but this ought not to be confused with multiculturality. Multiculturality, the Cuban-American theologian Orlando Espin explains, quote, is a theoretical image that wishes to describe the ability of one human group to create, sustain, function, comprehend reality, and much more in more than one way. Since this theoretical multicultural group does not and cannot exist, one wonders about the purpose behind the use of multiculturality and behind the insistence that it be implemented or somehow fashioned in society. Perhaps one should ask, who would benefit the most from the supposed implementation of multiculturality? In fact, who is in charge of defining multiculturality and judging when it has been sufficiently achieved? Even as that term multiculturality implies, the quest for equality and inclusiveness, it assumes that there is an already established reality into which others are now welcome. Far too often, the rhetoric or language and action of multiculturality undermine cultural diversity or cultural pluralism. It does so on behalf of the dominant group and its desire to demand and to preserve the status quo that confers their privilege and benefits. Multiculturality then may hide the fear of an inability to deal with cultural diversity. It well may be a mechanism to co-opt the dominated into accepting as the most real and social constructs and meanings of the dominant. The society in which we live, the United States, is rich in diverse human cultures. Indeed, what we know and experience as our country always has been a culturally diverse place. <coughs> Yet we have had, and still have, great difficulty with this diversity, with this difference. Far too often we focus on difference only to condemn or to ostracize. Conveniently, we forget or refuse to acknowledge that, as diverse cultures and people, we can learn from one another. In the English language, the language we speak, the noun difference 
connotes opposition, disagreement, quarrel, dispute. The most common synonyms for difference imply negative qualities or conditions and negative relations. Dissent, discord, disparity, discrepancy, estrangement, inequality. Our language betrays our best intentions, <laughs> our firmest resolve. Difference communicates that which is and those who are to be avoided. Political scientist and philosopher Iris Marion Young perceptively observes, quote, the ideal of liberation has come to mean the elimination of group difference, close quote. We have come to prefer and to reward uniformity. Subtly and not so subtly, we endorse the surrender, our surrender, to market values and repress the creativity and possibilities of diversity and difference. As religious believers, as men and women of goodwill, our fear of difference and cultural diversity undermines our assertion that God-oriented living or living for others, living from a transcendent vision of justice and peace. Living neighbor love, as the Hebrew and Christian scriptures teach, that love is inconsistent with dehumanization and deprivation. Our fear uncovers a form of despair in divine power and grace to change our hearts and our lives, to transform us as persons and our cultures from the inside out. So racist culture. Well, what is racism? Racism is an acquired cognitive and affective response that intentionally disrupts realization of human intersubjective relations. It does so intentionally and it disrupts. It's a learned or acquired affective and cognitive response. When we tie these intentional responses to the exercise of religious or cultural or social power, they serve to justify the systemic domination of children, women, and men of one race or races while simultaneously advancing and maintaining the privileged status of the one dominating race at the expense of all the others or other. Because racism goes beyond prejudice, even bigotry, by joining conscious misunderstanding and negative feeling to the exercise of power in a society, it need not rely on the choices or actions of a few rogue or bad individuals. Rather, racism is embedded in and transmitted by and carried forward through our unquestioned, unexamined, and unreflected upon standards symbols, habits, assumptions, reactions, and practices that underlie the whole of a society. Thus, racism permeates every sphere of social relations, the political, the economic, the technological. It permeates our legal and judicial structures and our penal codes. It permeates the creation and transmission of culture, education at all levels our literary and artistic expressions and projects, forms of communication and representation, leisure. Racism permeates human growth and development, our psychological, sexual, and spiritual lives and living. And we find racism in religion, in doctrine, in ritual, in laws and membership. To quote James Boggs, these, quote, interacting and developing processes operate so normally and naturally that the individuals involved are barely conscious of their operation, close quote. There are so very many repugnant aspects of racism. 
but none more daunting, more infuriating, and more dispiriting than its pervasive ordinariness. In the United States, living flesh and blood, children, women, and men live out their daily lives within contexts structured by racism. The most mundane activities, grocery shopping, banking, registering for school, inquiring about church membership, riding public transportation, applying for a mortgage. All these pulse with negative charges. This pervasive ordinariness can twist and distort the very meaning of generous and compassionate human living. Indeed, racism, sexism, anti-Semitism, transphobia, homophobia, our fear of differently able people, all of these, these issues are not mere problems to be solved. Rather, these are ways in which we live and define our reality, ways in which we live some of the most intimate moments of our lives. These issues are not something out there for us to solve or fix, rather they are sedimented in our consciousness. Thus, as Franz Fanon offers such a chilling indictment, the racist in a culture with racism is normal. The challenge, of course, is to become abnormal in this context. Well, what does it mean to speak about culture as racist or racist culture? How are we to account for the emergence, the extension of culture in this way? To repeat, concretely embedded in the institutions and structures, roles and tasks, operations and cooperations of our complex social order, our cultural meanings have cognitive, effective, constitutive, and communicative function. According to David Goldberg, racist culture is, quote, both and interrelatedly a signifying system and a system of material production and reproduction. In a racist culture, each and every human person is racially apprehended, conceived, judged, and manipulated. Each and every human person is reduced to biological physiognomy. The implications of innocuous physical traits skin color, hair texture, shape of head, body, facial features. All these are identified, exaggerated, ordered, and evaluated. On this basis, each woman and man is assigned a racial designation that structures her and his relations to other women and men, those of the same and those of different races. In this setup, racial, uh, one racial group is contrived as the measure of human being, and one racial group or groups are deemed, that one racial group is deemed normative. For meanings and values have embedded in, been embedded in those differences so as to favor or advantage that group, which has been contrived as the measure of human being. So virtue, morality, and goodness are assigned to one group, while vice, immorality, and evil are assigned to the other or others. Entitlement, power, and privilege are accorded one group while dispossession and powerlessness and disadvantage define the other or other. Finally, in a racist culture or a culture based on racial privilege and preference, racial differences are rendered absolute. How is this done? It's done by generalizing from them and claiming that they are final. And if the difference is totalized, if it penetrates the flesh, the blood, and the genes of the victim, it is transformed into fate, into destiny, into heredity. All feminist critiques recognize this. Biology is not destiny. Biology is not destiny. Once that difference is transformed into fate or destiny or heredity, then the absolutized difference is naturalized. Now it encompasses not merely an individual person, the lone human subject, but all persons like her or him. Whatever the difference, it is made to penetrate profoundly and collectively. It is final, complete, 
inescapable. Those who are racially different then, who diverge from this norm, diverge what it, from what it means to be a human being, diverge from being human. Racist culture, or a culture founded on racism's racial privilege, is really a biased culture, a biased culture. With the Jesuit philosopher and theologian Bernard Lonergan, I want to give that term bias a very technical and specific denotation. Rather than the common sense notion of preference or inclination of temperament, we can define bias as the more or less conscious and deliberate choice in the face of what we perceive to be potential threat to our well-being to exclude further information or data from consideration in our understanding, in our judgment, in our reflection, in our decision. Bias is the more or less conscious choice to be incorrect, to repress what we know, to turn away from the truths that are presented to us. All human beings, all human beings are susceptible to bias. It distorts and inhibits our conscious performance in everyday living by blinding our understanding. We can distinguish four principal forms of bias. I want to speak only about three of these. But there is, of course, the dramatic bias, which really affects our daily living, our affective, our psychological development and expression, individual bias, group bias, and the general bias of common sense. Dramatic bias takes the form of the denial of affect in day-to-day -day living. It reveals itself not only in a refusal to understand, but in a refusal to behave and grow emotionally in healthy and life-giving ways. Dramatic bias may trap us in and feed our immaturity, proje projecting an idealized picture of ourselves, evidence notwithstanding, so that when we make decisions, we eliminate from consideration any any dimension of our affect that is at odds with our idealized picture. But attentiveness to our feelings is always important because if we deny that we feel resentment or anger or fear, that we feel used or exploited, that we feel disappointed in a parent or spouse or friend, we are repressing feelings that are flooding and suffusing all that we think and do. Dramatic bias thrives in a racist culture. Members of the dominant or privileged racial group are given permission to project their personal inadequacies on members of the dominant or non-privileged group. These women and men harm not only themselves by blunting the invitation to self-transcendence, they cause incalculable suffering to those whom they dominate. The oppressed, too, are unable to face and incorporate their own personal inadequacies in their daily living. They, too, are beset with internalized self-doubt and self-hatred. Individual bias is a conscious distortion in development, not only of the individual's intelligence, but of her and his affective and experiential orientation as well. In a racist society, individual bias manifests itself in selfish pursuit of personal desires at the expense of human relationships and social cooperations, at the expense of the common good of culture and society. When we yield to the temptation of individual bias, we refuse opportunities to meet others who are different from us, to engage them, to open ourselves to them. When we yield to the temptation of individual bias, we repudiate the intersubjectivity that is a basic component of our humanity. For affective and cognitive development occurs only within intersubjectivity. When we yield to the temptation of individual bias, we wind up with a set of distorted experiences which become the foundation for distorted understandings of other women and men and their cultures or societies. Although individual bias 
is, a potential, is potentially operative in any society. The distortions that result in political, economic, and technological patterns in that society cannot be attributed to the individual alone. In a racist culture, group bias finds oppression in ethnic chauvinism, in jingoistic patriotism, in crude nativism, and in racial ethnic conflict, thus upending the common human good. Group bias sacrifices intelligence and responsible discernment in bringing about the common good in culture. It sacrifices that common good to the vicious pursuit of the interests of the dominant racial group. Insights that might include the experiences or interests of other groups are stifled and repressed or manipulated and repackaged. Members of the dominant group reject authentic solidarity with the pain and suffering of marginalized persons. Thus, they withdraw from sensitive and experiential contact with the dominated or non-privileged members of a society. Their biased decisions and actions are enforced not only through legislation and custom, but also through police control. In such situations, it is not surprising that marginalized racial ethnic groups take up civil disobedience or erupt in bitterness, frustration, and rebellion. In such situations, the course of authentic human and social development are derailed. And the conditions for generating new intelligent insights and taking practical, responsible, healing and creating action to meet and reverse the deteriorating decline in society are precluded. We can speak about racism also theologically. In their 1979 pastoral letter, Brothers and Sisters to Us, the U.S. Catholic bishops define racism as, quote, a sin that divides the human family, blots out the image of God among specific members of that family, violates the fundamental dignity of those called to be children of the same creator. South African theologian John de Grucci argues that where racism and cultural imperialism are, quote, regimentally imposed, they deny the community of believers the possibility of being human and deny the reconciling and humanizing work of Christ, close quote. For Jews and Christians, racism is at once idolatry and heresy. It seeks to replace the sovereignty of God with an idol of our own human making. So disturbing aesthetics. The term aesthetics refers narrowly to critical reflection on and judgment of art and culture and nature. More comprehensively yet ambiguously, aesthetics concerns beauty. Beauty in the art of thinking, beauty in making or crafting, that is the concrete creative rendering of products of imagination, beauty in being, in doing, in acting or performing. The philosopher Elaine Scarry distinguishes four key features of beauty. Beauty, she writes, is sacred, unprecedented, life-affirming, and intelligible. The beautiful evokes awe and reverence. Responses to, the, to beauty are commanded by the encounter with the divine, the holy other. Beauty is singular even as it prompts creativity, improvisation. Beauty nourishes us and incites a longing for what is true. But within a racist culture, beauty erases and occludes what cannot be beautiful. Brown bodies are made malevolent, diseased, drug-carrying, usurpers, and criminal. Black bodies are rendered repulsive, encoding the hideous and warped. Black and brown, female, and differently abled and trans bodies remain heavily mired in dross and slog, far from reason, far from goodness, and far from beauty. My objective is not an exhaustive theory of beauty nor an explicit theological and moral aesthetics. But rather, as a Christian theologian, 
I want to take a perspective by which to suggest that our apprehension of beauty possesses a role in motivating morality and action in our world. I want to trouble our cultural apprehension of beauty by considering through three means through which we encounter beauty. These are not the only means, but they're three. Sight, gesture, form, or color, sound, word or speech or hearing, and performance, movement or being or action. That's what I want to focus on, those three. Sight, sound, word or speech or hearing, and performance, movement or being or action. Regarding sight, we may draw on Michel Foucault's notion of the normalizing gaze of modern reason. This gaze assesses its object according to a set of standards and calibrates and measures degrees of conformity to and variance from those standards. It is a gaze, Foucault writes, that, quote, compares, differentiates, hierarchizes, homogenizes, and excludes, close quote. It is, I argue, a pornographic gaze. It objectifies. It's a racist gaze that excludes, a coercive gaze that disempowers, a carceral gaze that profiles, marks, and surveys. We human persons, we construct aesthetic and moral scales that affirm our group and ourselves as trustworthy intelligent, and thus are constituted as rational universal subjects. At the same time, we label and categorize other human persons outside our group as dangerous, as ignorant, degenerate, and thus are formed as irrational particular existence or beings, not universal rational subjects, but particular irrational existence. In ordinary settings, whether a restaurant or a classroom, a hotel lobby or a church building, we tend to otherize human persons whom we perceive and see and decide look different. Their form is different. Their very physical, uh, sorry, their very physical appearance and presence disturb the prevailing and comforting visual racial aesthetics. They stand out. Regarding sound, we must learn to cultivate openness to diverse, different, and differentiated discourses and patterns or rhythms of speech. Attentiveness to sound, attuning the ear to the pattern of a different rhythm may prepare us to hear what is not said, what is difficult to speak, prepares us to hear who speaks and who does not. Attentiveness to sound may teach us to listen not for what we deem exotic or pathological, but for the human cry for belonging, for compassion, for care. Consider our growing sensitivity as a nation to sexual predation. We rightly have been outraged by women's reports of sexual harassment, degradation and abuse, of rape and forced sexual contact. The hashtag MeToo campaign has given voice to the painful conflict and suffering of hundreds of women, women who are speaking out, some for the very first time, women who are saying what has not been said, what they could not say, what they felt they should not say. They need to speak to us and we need to hear. If we look though very closely and see the women with whom we empathize, we might recognize that nearly all of these women are highly influential and well-known, often affluent and usually white. Quite likely, few of us know that a black woman, Tarana Burke, originated the Me Too campaign without hashtag more than 10 years ago. She conceived the phrase as a way to reach out, in particular to women of color who had been sexually harassed, abused, degraded, or raped. She envisioned Me Too as a way of supporting women 
of women supporting one another, hearing one another into speech, disrupting the silence. That we don't know this is a failure of our sight, our looking carefully and analyzing where and listening for where voices are coming. Finally, regarding performance, we are all being challenged by the activism of our citizens, young men and women who are outraged at our silence, our devotion to respectability, our cultivation of power and self-pride, our indifference at the death of others. In 2013, three organizers in response to the acquittal of Trayvon Martin's murderer, black women Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tometi developed a black-centered political action and movement project called Hashtag Black Lives Matter. The purpose was and is theoretical and, quote, political intervention in a world where black lives are systematically and intentionally targeted for demise, close quote. The deaths of Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Eric Garner, Walter Scott, Tanisha Anderson, Maya Hall, Andy Lopez, Sandra Bland, Philando Castile, and too many other black and brown youth, women and men, at the hands of police are egregious manifestations of the failure of the system of justice in our country. After burying their friends and teacher students at Marjorie Stoneham High School in Parkland, Florida, Students like Cameron Caskey and Emma Gonzalez, Daniel Hogg, and dozens of others formed a movement geared to interrupt the sale and purchase of assault weapons. These young people want, to, want, us, want us to remember the death of Alicia Aldeheff, Martin Duke Anguino, Nicholas DeWart, Jamie Gutenberg, Luke Hoyer, Cara Logren, Elena Petty, Meadow Pollock, Alex Schachter, Peter Wang, and the other teachers and students who died at the hands of a rogue individual who purchased and modified weapons solely for murder. These students, as you know, have called for and organized a national demonstration, March for Our Lives, to take place on Saturday, March 24th in Washington, D.C. They are determined to have us open our eyes and hear the cries of people to recognize our indifference and irrationality when it comes to guns. Black Lives Matter and March for Our Lives, as called by the students from Marjorie Stoneham Douglas High School, are two instances of contemporary performance-oriented actions for realizing justice in our society. What a mess we have made of our common human good. We neither have seen the bodies nor heard the voices of impoverished, dark, poor, excluded, or minoritized children, youth, women, and men, of poor white people living in Appalachia or in rural areas in the South and in the Midwest and North. As a moral community, our performance is not merely flawed, it has collapsed. With little more than a shrug, we have accepted disorder as normal. This is not normal. Societally or communally and individually or personally, we are in dire need of intellectual and moral change, transformation. And we must bring our religious consciousness and experience, our commitment to something transcendent. We must bring our lived faith to bear on the transformation needed in our society. So what, is a, what can we say about the stance and practice of religious believers when the very tasks of witness and worship are situated in a racist culture? Well, in a racist culture, we must disturb aesthetics, disturb the moral, spiritual, and spatial sensibilities created by false multiculturalism that homogenizes us all. At the very least, we must take on responsibilities of resistance and engagement. 
To resist the racism with which we have constructed our culture and society, we must begin, and vigorously so, to contest and dispute any and all exclusionary values, criteria, and practices. And at the same time, we are challenged to engagement, to articulate new values, new criteria, new practices for a life of human flourishing for all of us. Just a few points. First, to resist the powerful racism embedded in our national consciousness that has shaped our culture and our concrete vital living, we must take race and racism seriously. To do this means we must reject the liberal reduction of race to a morally irrelevant category. And we must reduce the reduction of racism to the personal prejudices or bigotry of a few individuals. Taking race and racism seriously means to expose, uncover our racialized history and its accompanying histories of racist exclusions and brutalities which are concealed beneath our self-promoting narratives. Second, to resist the powerful racism that has shaped our culture, we must open ourselves to other people and their cultures. Certainly in an historical and social matrix dominated by racism, genuine openness to other and different cultures and peoples is never easy. On the one hand, we need to be very wary of superficial approaches that allow us to sort of trick ourselves confusing excitement with the new, the different, the exotic, simply because it's new and different and exotic. It's easy then to slip into a kind of relativism that shifts position, not to gain perspective, but to gain powerful and relative distance. From that distance, then we can move on to seek out the next novelty and the next and the next people and the next culture. We collect them. Huh? We find that our attention is so easily distracted, our understanding so cursory, our judgments so perfunctory, our criticisms so facile. Too often, too often, with little or no historical understanding or knowledge, we simply imitate practices that are constitutive of a particular culture. We lack critical, authentic understanding, and we fail to recognize that such imitation may be sheer tokenism and arrogance. Lacking authentic judgment, we omit criteria that's crucial in understanding the internal coherence and relation of practices to one another. And lacking authentic commitment to the hard habitual work of the daily living and incarnating a culture, we have little appreciation for the particular demands of sustaining those meanings, those values, those institutions and practices. <laughs> On the other hand, we can't simply retreat from encounter and engagement with other and different peoples and cultures. We can't do it just because it's difficult and fraught with negative possibilities. We can't run away. We are really called to risk. Not only that encounter and engagement, but the change, the transformation that it brings about, may bring about in us. Resisting racism will bring about change in us change in our attentiveness, in our questions, in our reflections, in our judgments, in our decisions, in our living, in our lives. Third, we must never forget that human persons are never reducible to atoms or theorems, to statistics or social problems, nor are they reducible to metaphors or attributes or categories. Women and men are instances of the intelligible as intelligent in the world. They are instances of incarnate moral and ethical choice in a world under the influence of sin, yet standing in relation to a field Christians believe of supernatural grace. Such a praxis then emphasizes and engages humanity's essential humanness, for in truth, racism is not a constant of the human spirit. Our resistance, certainly for Christians, must be rooted in a new notion of person, one that acknowledges, confesses, testifies, and witnesses that all human beings are one in Christ Jesus. Moreover, that same understanding of the person acknowledges and confesses 
that our unity is incomplete unless we honor the riches of our difference. Let me conclude. Our society's need for transformation, our personal and individual need for transformation of mind and heart, not only is necessary, it is crucial. To paraphrase the words of Gaudium et Spes, such a transformation cannot occur unless each of us as individual human persons cultivate in ourselves moral and social virtues and then promote them in society. Our history as a nation is mired in genocide, expropriation of land, racism, misogyny, and economic exploitation. We the living are not guilty of the historic injustices and crimes against human life that were perpetrated prior to and in the founding of the nation through the 19th and most of the 20th century. We are not guilty of these historic injustices. But we are, however, responsible for the present in which we live. The brutalities and sins of our past have created the troubled future we have. This is our troubled present. We have the responsibility to refuse to be complicit with those brutalities and those sins. Those of us who are beneficiaries of the privileges of race or gender or expropriation or economic exploitation have a special moral and social responsibility to recognize those privileges to acknowledge their continuities with historic injustices, and to act to transform the institutions that provide us with this privilege. We have the obligation to pursue remedies through which we might forge more humane and human relationships, new and human and humane futures for us all. As a Christian theologian, I believe that with the gratuitous and merciful help of divine grace, we may yet become true artisans of a new humanity. Thank you very much. Did you entertain some questions? Sure. Sure. It's okay. No, no. Let me see. So. So we do have a couple of roving microphones here for questions. And uh, I might add that after we finish, uh, there, uh, there was some question about whether there was a reception after. There's not a reception after, but there will be some books to be signed and more conversation. Before that, however, and there's a book table just out here. Before that, however, uh, if you have a question, please uh, raise a hand and we'll get a microphone to you. Two questions. What are your thoughts on Archbishop Oscar Romero, and also what are your thoughts on the Nation of Islam? <laughs> and, and Dr. Copeland, I don't think they can hear you without the microphone. Oh, yeah, that'll. Archbishop Romero, uh, as you well know, was martyred in El Salvador. He himself um, has gone through, a, went through a tremendous uh, personal conversion, um, uh, which brought him uh, to a deeper understanding of the lives of ordinary people in El Salvador and their their structured suffering. And so. Um, uh, Michael Lee has just written a book on uh, Archbishop Romero um, and his, his, the way in which his life has really fueled theology in uh, El Salvador. Um, so he becomes a model to me, or an exemplar, let's say, of what it might mean to really effect in your own lifetime a real transformation, uh, to reach out to others. Uh, just because we're all, the, okay, so we're talking about more or less homogeneous society, but there's lots of class stuff going on there. And 
And so he's reaching, you know, reflecting on his own desire for upward mobility and then seeing where that leads and, and making a real turn. So, so to me, this is an exemplar of someone who, who was trying to teach us something about what it might mean to live uh, a humane, uh, a human way. The Nation of Islam, I mean, I haven't really uh, paid much attention to the Nation of Islam recently. Um, and uh, so I don't, I don't know what they're writing. You know, I can only think of them, you know, like 30 years ago. And, uh, and there may be some changes in the Nation of Islam that I just don't know about. And if someone here does, you know, that person could maybe help you better than I in, in that topic. Um, I mean, in some ways, uh, groups, groups such as that one become, Martin Luther King uh, in Where Do We Go From Here uh, is saying that the best defense against uh, communism, he said, he's writing this in 1967, the best defense against communism is good democracy. So the best defense, uh, you, you could say, you could turn it around and say we wouldn't have a nation of Islam if we really had a real Christianity. But what they're doing now, I mean, I really don't know. And I mean, we don't have a real Christianity now, you know. I mean, as far as I can see, Jesus' people let him down. I mean, I'm one of those people, and I'm trying hard not to, you know, on a daily basis, not always succeeding. Uh, I was wondering about your thoughts on cultural appropriation. Sorry, over here. Okay. <laughs> oh. mm -hmm. um, I was wondering about your thoughts about cultural appropriation and the difference between celebrating other cultures versus essentially stealing them and claiming them as your own. Well, I mean, I tried to say something about that by saying, you know, we, we, we commandeer sometimes. I didn't use that word commandeer in the talk, but I'm driving there, that we, we find some things interesting and so we want, we want to share in them. And we do so very casually without much thought. Um, we don't know where these practices might fit and what they really are about. Uh, but they look interesting to us and so we take them on. So that's cultural appropriation. That's not the same thing as really learning someone else's culture <coughs> and learning your place in relation to that. So uh, you, you all do study abroad, so many of you go, and you learn how to operate another culture and you get some good ideas. Um, but you also recognize that you can't just bring some of those ideas back here because they're outside their setting. And once they're out of their setting, they really don't have, they just don't have a function anymore. So, so cultural appropriation is, a, and there, there were a lot of arguments about this uh, in, in the 90s uh, around this issue. And it, it, it crops up periodically. So I don't know if that's sufficient or not. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not for, you know, for grabbing someone's, uh, you know, sweat lodge and hanging out in it because it looks so cool, you know. <laughs> I mean, what does that mean? We have no idea. You know, it just looks cool. To, that, that's, that's my critique. It just looks cool to us, you know. But we have no idea where it fits. You know, you know, because it's not just something isolated, it has a place in a culture. Is that useful? Okay, fine, good. Oh, I'm not the loop in. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Copeland, Sean. Dr. Lookins. Sean. I want to say first how grateful we are for your time and your teaching here and also for the work and witness that you've had since then. We are really <coughs> grateful to you. Thank you. You mentioned early uh, the ideal of living for others. And as you know, there's a, there's a pretty effective movement for reconfiguring our understanding of morality away from some of its traditional sources to the understanding of being responsible for the other. Mm. And that's generated a huge debate about how we define the other. 
And for a lot of people, it's a negative definition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's, that's exactly what we do not want. We want to encourage a positive understanding of the other. And I think that's really, that has to be a critical factor in our discussion of racism. Oh, sure. And I really was intrigued by this notion of the encounter with the beauty of the other, mm. or at least that's what mm. I heard. What I want you to uh, help us is to understand what, what are the agents for this kind of aesthetic challenge, this aesthetic change in which we see the other uh, in an, as an encounter of beauty. Mm -hmm. yeah. is that, does that make sense? Yeah, yes, and, it's, and this, is, this is part of our problem. This is part of our problem. We can't see that. If, if I think about the, wor the use of the word other is always complex because um, it gets used here in a couple different ways. To other eyes, we know this, you know, there we all want belonging. We all want to belong to something. And um, when we come to some new place, when we come to some new endeavor, we want, to, we want to belong. But sometimes it doesn't happen. And sometimes the sometimes are just repetitive and they're constant. And we have some social ways of doing with that, dealing with that now. We want to be concerned about bullying and we want to be concerned about variety of things that we don't want things to happen to people. But on a social level, the way in which, which we have structured ourselves as a people, as a society, we have a hierarchy of preferences which have been, this is part of the unconscious assumption, it's part of our unreflected upon um, notions, assumptions, ideas, presuppositions, habits. If I take um, if I take uh, music, um, I, I don't listen to rap music. Um, I stopped about I guess maybe after Tupac Shakur died. I guess I stopped listening to you know. And everybody here is going oh, that wasn't really rap at all. You know, I, I don't listen. I don't. But but I but I see, and statistics are telling us. Um, Studies are telling us that young white men are the people who purchase this music most of all. But what's also true is that, is that that identity, being a young white man, okay, you're under 25, you know, somewhere between 17 and 20, 24, 25, I don't know, that that person, in fact, um, has, has picked up something that he doesn't really know about. And at the same time, because we are able in fact, because, because we're human, huh? We all have angst and anxieties and so there's something that those, p that those young men are picking up in that music. I'm not sure what it is, but they're getting something that they find either interesting or they find does something for them in some way. So, so there's that, but then some of them are the same people who are, wa who are, who are off in Charlottesville somewhere. Here's where the point about acquired behavior, uh, an acquired affective and cognitive behavior. Um, it, King says at one point, America's really schizophrenic about race that we really have these ideals that we're all one, we're all together, and then we're saying, but yet, but not you. But not you. So, uh, e or, or think of um, Langston Hughes, I Too Sing America, you know, and, and, and how that poem ends. Someday they will see that I am beautiful. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's, the, it's the yearning for acceptance. It's the yearning for that. So. How do we see beauty in the other? We have to learn how, beauty is always in the eye of the beholder, okay, we know that, that's a kind of common sense point, but we forget that beauty is too, the eye has to be trained. The eye is trained. 
So, so you know what's beautiful because it's passed on to you. You, you acquire a knowledge and you can refine that so that we can talk, those, of those people who are in English literature here, who are faculty, who are, who are charting my aesthetics here, you know about taste, which is cultivated. Uh, it's, not, it's not just something simple. Some, some few people are, just seem to be born with it, but, but, but it's, hard, it's hard to see the beauty in the other because even, th this, is, this is the transmission of this, so I could say, well, okay, my generation, these people, we, we had these horrible things that made you think that the lighter you were, the better you were. The closer you were to white, the better you were. But it's sad to see young college kids today saying the very same thing. Which means that in, in a real way, our preference for beauty remains the same. It hasn't changed in 50 years which means it hasn't changed in a hundred years, and it hasn't changed in, and, and I think that's, that's our struggle. So we have to learn different criteria for beauty. Here's where our performance has to become beautiful. Our actions have to work toward what's beautiful. So it's, that's not the best answer, but, but it's got some elements. It's got some elements of an answer in that way. Because I think young people are really, this, I'll stop, young people really are trying also to teach us something. I think we all find these young high school students <laughs> impressive. But as I said last night to the students, how will I know what to listen to if you don't tell me? I won't know, I won't know what, what's really fueling you unless you tell me. And so then I have to go to where you are to find out. I have to go to your music, to your, your movies, your with fear and trembling, but, but I have to go. <laughs> but, but, but what's also, so we have, to, we have to find people who can help us find out how beauty functions or what are the criteria or the aspects or the dimensions of beauty in other places. That's the risk, that's the risk of, of beauty, of, of encounter and engagement, and that's the risk about cultural appropriation. That's the other risk, you know. We, we hated fist bumps for a long time. You know, nobody did that. That was a horrible thing. Everybody, we all do it now, huh? So we've commanded something from people that we really don't want to be around. You know? I, I don't know if, I can't find anybody in here right now with a baseball hat on turned backwards, but where did, it, it, that, that's it. W okay, all right, all right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> did I see you last night? Yeah, okay, that's my t-shirt. <laughs> okay, that's good, I like that. <laughs> but but so we do these things, but, we don't, but then we don't wanna be with the people. You know, we want the things, but not the people. And that's another one of our problems. That's back to cultural appropriation again. And you, you, you can't have the things without the people. That's one thing we have to really admit to ourselves. We can't have the things without the people. In that same vein, maybe one more question from one of our students. Yeah, let's talk to them. Okay, let's go with the people. <laughs> oh, okay. Let's do two. Okay, let's do so. Two more. We're not ready to let her go yet. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Forgive me for probably butchering the name, but what is your opinion of uh, the works of Paulo Freire? Yes. <laughs> Paulo Freire is very important, I think, to educators in the sense that he's trying to remind us that standing up and lecturing is not always the best thing to do. You know, <laughs> that it can be useful sometimes. That's the only way to get some information to people efficiently and quickly. But, but the real challenge is to see how people are learning in terms of their own experience. Okay, experience, the, ne the nebulous word here, their own social experience, their own cultural experience. Um, how, they're, how they are, in fact, um, uh, questioning what, what's going on in their world. And, and that's, the, that's the point of Freire, is to get, is to get people to question. You know, you know I, I, yeah, that's the point of Freire, to get people to question. And that's the, that's the point. That's, that's no different than Socrates. 
so different than Socrates. But but we we are we're, we're you know somehow one is but but they're both doing the same thing for people from different ends, huh? And Socrates wound up dead. Remember, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was accused of corrupting the youth in Athens. Uh, are these the values that you want, or what values do you want? You know, yeah. Okay. That's okay. Did we have one more? Yeah, right there. Here he is. He's right there. <coughs> uh, so you had said that you uh, think it's really important for us to uh, embrace the richness in the differences between groups of people. So I'm really curious as to what you think about Coates' idea that racism in itself begets race and that getting rid of racism gets rid of race. I don't agree with that um, in this way. Um, there's really only one race, the human race. But racism is very real. Um, and I, okay, the amount of melanin that everybody has in their skin is irrelevant to some extent. But what we've undergone here is racial formation. That's the, that's the, that's the struggle, that's, that's the, a surrender to the unthematized, unquestioned, unreflected upon. And we've been formed in this way, and we're more or less formed not to get out of our boxes. We're more or less formed to really um, think in the way, this is, this is the point about it being an acquired, it becomes that, we acquire it. And again, it's not that you have to worry about one person, it, the whole structure of our society is doing this to us. The way in which we think about the economy, the way in which we think about politics, who should run for office and who shouldn't, the way we think about um, uh, what's good legislation and what isn't, the way we think that somebody's gonna get something that I'm not going to get if we pass this law, um, that if somebody gets their hands on the ability to vote, wow, that'll be, should we, re should we gerrymander this district in this way? How do we keep control? I mean, there's a, there, there are people here, I'm sure, who, who are doing uh, U.S. history who, who, can, who can help you understand that, help us all understand that. So, so I think um, in this sense, we'll always find some way, this is, this is where racism is shape-shifting. So we'll find some way to create another case to put people in. We don't have, if, if a number of students have seen 13th, the documentary on prisons. This is uh, Michelle Alexander's point. We, we're, we have the 13th Amendment, okay, so what have we done? We had Jim Crow, we got rid of Jim Crow. Now we have a new Jim Crow. Now we have people who are in a case system that they can't get out of. Which is not to say that there are not really bad people in prisons, of course there are. Of course there are, but there are, a, there, there are a, a, a large number of people who should not be there. A large number of people. And once you're there, and you're there for a long time, it's pretty hard to hold your own character out against the forces of what you're encountering in this sort of a place, because it's all you have. It's all you have. So, so yes, I think that, that there is a, I, I don't quite agree with that. You know, I'd have to read his argument much more closely, but on the face of it, no, I, I don't, I, I think, it, and there's nothing wrong with, I, th the problem with this is that in the United States, and I'll stop here, is that you know, we, we've done this thing of using race, <coughs> which is part of our, excuse me, our, uh, our problem. Let me stop. <coughs> okay. good, yeah. please, please join us in thanking Dr. Copeland. Okay. Uh, there are still, uh, I think, a few books out there, uh, and we'd like to give Dr. Copeland a chance to make her way uh, back to the book table. So um, as she does that, I know Maggie had an announcement for us about an upcoming program. Yeah, so if you could all just pause for one quick second. Um, 
Dr. Copeland, in her address tonight, mentioned the Parkland Students March for Our Lives campaign. Tomorrow night in the Norman Miller Center, we are making signs and placards for March for Our Lives. There's going to be a Green Bay uh, sibling march starting at the city deck on Saturday at 10 a.m. So tomorrow night, we are making placards in the Norman Miller Center. It's bring your own poster board. Um, to, uh, to get ready in preparation for that. If you have questions, you can talk to Bryn Anderson in the GAP office or myself. Thank you very much.